Don't ask me the tough questions because I don't know. I'm just gonna make it all up. <laughs> Again, sorry. Hi, my name is Joseph Godsey. I'm Vice President responsible for digital strategy and delivery as part of the digital brand commerce team at Adidas. I'm insanely passionate about RFID technology and the game changer that brings to us as a company. RFID is a radio frequency identifier. It looks simple, so to a naked eye, it looks like a standard label, but inside is a chip. RFID is all about speed, efficiency, and stock accuracy. So traditionally, you would need to scan this barcode, it needs to be visual, but with RFID, you simply point and click, and it'll tell you how many picked up, oh, 130 and counting. A box would arrive from the DC uh, into the store. If you take the gun, you can simply scan the box, it'll tell you exactly what products are in there, what sizes, then you would see what inventory needs to make its way to the sales floor, and then you would essentially pick and choose what you need. With RFID technology, we are able to do a stock take within minutes while the staff member is just walking with a handheld through the store. And with this, we are able to eliminate discrepancies in our system and have the right product at the right place. Stock accuracy goes through the roof to about 99.9%. .9%, and for those of you keeping track at home, that's pretty good. I can walk into a changing room in the future and I can immediately see the products that a consumer has brought into that changing room. I can request other interactions where I'm interested in different sizes because immediately I know if those products are available in the store or not with a very high level of accuracy. The RFID readers are placed under the cash out desk. This speeds up the processes and make our life and the life of the consumers easier. It changes the game how staff drive their day-to-day -day interactions in the store. And at the end, it's about enabling omni-channel by having that high-level quality of inventory, uh, accuracy, and really enabling those game-changing experiences which impact the consumer as well. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I first have to apologize to the people behind the, this. So I'm here. I apologize that I can't see you there. Um, we, my name is Francisco Mello, I run the RFID business for Avery Dennison, and um, today we're really going to be discussing, I mean, a lot has been said about the RFID benefits to inventory accuracy and visibility, and how that serves as a backbone or as an enabler, if you'd like, for improved consumer experience. And today we're really going to be looking uh, into what has changed over the, uh, the, this past year, as well as a little bit into what we believe is next. So what are the new use cases, the emerging areas that we see evolving from, uh, from now on? Uh, to, uh, to help me with this process, I must say I'm delighted to have uh, 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 an amazing group of panelists. Again, thank you all for joining. Uh, on, my, uh, on my right, we've got uh, Dr. Bill Hardgrave, he's the Provost, Vice President of Academic Affairs for Auburn University. Um, Dr. Hardgrave is uh, probably one of the biggest thought leaders in the RFID field, I, uh, and uh, probably he should be introducing me versus me introducing him, but you know, that's the way uh, we've set this up. So, uh, again, is, is also the man behind the, uh, the RFID lab, originally at Arkansas, and then migrating to Auburn as well. So thank you for joining, Dr. Hargrave. Um, in the middle, we've got uh, Tvetsen Dimitrov. Uh, Tvetsen is the uh, director of business solutions for RFID for the Adidas group. Uh, again, thank you very much for the video, Tvetsen and the Adidas team, uh, amazing video. Uh, Tvetsen has been involved in uh, RFID for, I guess, close to five years now, all the way from sort of the origins of the pilots and the deployments that Adidas as a global brand is probably one of the brands that's kind of pushing the boundaries of RFID adoption worldwide. And uh, at the end, we've got Marco. Uh, uh, Marco Cunha is the director of supply chain for the sports and, uh, and fashion uh, for Sonai. Sonai is a, a Portuguese uh, multi-brand retailer that's got both private brand and multi-brand. Um, they've successfully deployed uh, last year uh, in 2017 their, uh, their project. And obviously, we'll hear from Marco uh, their experiences and also uh, what, that, uh, what that sort of includes. At the end, we're going to be opening up to a few questions from uh, the audience. So uh, if you've got questions, please jot them down and just you know, bear with us just to make sure we got the right flow here, if that's possible. So um, with that, I mean, Dr. Hargrave, I'd like to, to start with you just to say, you know, what, what, what have you been seeing as sort of the, 
emerging trends and sort of key observations uh, over this past year, and then we'll build from the team about what evolution have you guys seen over the past year. We're going to have this in a very conversational flow with not a lot of sort of setup. So uh, the idea is really just to have a conversation about the key topics. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come to the session. Uh, yeah, so really, since last year, what we've seen is uh, more work in the area of inventory accuracy. You know, for the last several years, we've, we've been talking about the importance of inventory accuracy as the foundation for omni-channel. And, and then drill down a little bit further than that as RFID, as the facilitator and enabler of inventory accuracy uh, in a, in a cost-effective way. And I, I would make three observations then, really what we've seen since last year in particular. We, in, in 2017, we saw more retailers and brand owners really embracing this idea of high inventory accuracy and the need for that in an omni-channel environment. So that's, that's the first observation. The second observation is that we saw more retailers paying lip service to inventory accuracy but not actually doing anything about it. In fact, we saw some epic fails in some attempts uh, to fool themselves into thinking they had high, high inventory accuracy and, and just resulted in some, some terrible mistakes uh, from the retailers. And then the third thing I would, uh, the third observation is that it, we started inventory accuracy, the, the discussion around inventory accuracy as a store level issue, but now we're seeing Rightfully so, the inventory accuracy and RFID spread upstream to include all supply chain partners. So uh, we'll, I know we'll drill down into each of those three observations as we go on, but those are three quick op observations uh, since last year. That's great, appreciate it. Fetan, just, I mean, what, what's happened uh, with the Adidas group uh, since last year? Since last year, we managed to open additional 100 stores in Russia, supporting by the local Russian team and global IT team that uh, Big improvement. However, our focus was uh, in the North American market where we managed to roll out several stores, additional pilots, and we launched a new iOS based software uh, system and we launched additional new hardware devices, which means that we started from the scratch in North America. And uh, for us, this was uh, again a new beginning uh, exploring the capabilities of RFID industry within a new market. Okay, excellent. Appreciate it. Marco? Well, um, first of all, I'm glad to, to be here. I would like to thank you to Francisco and uh, to be here with such a great panel. Uh, I came from a small country, so Portugal, the country of Cristiano Ronaldo and also from Francisco, coincidentally. Um, I would like to, to, to share a bit. We are uh, new in, the, in this journey. We started the RFID journey at Sonai since three years ago, okay? And sharing a bit the, the challenge we had at um, that time. First of all, the pillar, the stock accuracy, okay? And it, it's, it's important to highlight the, the importance of the, the stock accuracy, well, to define the baseline. At that time, we were more or less on 80% on SKU accuracy, so color, size, level, okay? And the second challenge we have at that time, because we, are, uh, we have 120 organic stores, was the sales floor availability that we were at that time behind 85%, so 15% of uh, stockouts. And at the end, all the, 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 the story ends with the omni-channel capabilities, okay? I'm glad to, to, to have here Svetan from Adidas. We are a, a multi-brand uh, retailer, so we buy from Adidas. And given uh, the example of Adidas, on the omni-channel, on the web online, uh, we have an availability of 60% of the in-season, okay? It's a very poor availability because we are shipping from the DC, okay? And that's, these were the, the, the main challenge um, to decide to start the RFID journey. That's excellent. So, uh, um, I mean, I also understand that you have the, you, as you mentioned, the tagging of your private brand and the multi-brand perspective i mean any comments there any learnings from that perspective i mean how did that process go uh, yeah and then maybe Tvetan can build on that linkage towards the brand yeah um sharing a bit of course we have the private level and 
and uh, suppliers labels like uh, Adidas, 70% uh, private labels. So we start the source tracking process in the Middle East, China, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, okay? And we, we've done at that time several um, pilots with the first tier suppliers and uh, the, 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 the pilots run quite well and we've deployed 100% of the private label um, with source tagging, okay? And the second step was starting to mm -hmm. negotiating and meeting the, the, the A brands, okay? And we've covered 80% of the brands because uh, it's a fact. Everyone is talking about RFID. Everyone is aware about the benefits of uh, RFID. And that's why, uh, surprisingly, it, it runs very well in terms of coverage. So 80% of our uh, brands are tagging uh, RFID for our company. So, so Marco and the rest, so apparently people are having sort of difficulties hearing us at the end, so we need to sort of to project our voice so that okay. we kind of, you know, there's a mic there as well in case you... So I'll take it from Marco. I remember last year Marco actually was part of the audience uh, asking the question, when you guys will start tagging for us uh, in Portugal. Portugal. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, then. Good job. So, one year, one year later. Okay, now it's gone. Okay, one year later, we are here with Marco. We are proud that we can uh, together work as a team and we can service our uh, wholesale partners. And this is actually the key differentiator between the Russian business you know, case get and between the Russian business case and the one in the uh, United States. Actually, we built on top, I don't know, this one, this one, this one doesn't work very well. Check, one, two, three, okay. So this is the main differentiator between the Russian business case and the US business case. This year, when we penetrated the North American market, we decided that we were trying to service our wholesale partners in North America and to build in the capability to attack for them at source. I think this is um, another, another important pillar that we built as a partner towards the national brands. That's great, that's great. Thank you, Tzatzan. And um, I'll try to see if, uh, if so everyone can, can hear us. Bill, can you elaborate a little bit further on the, the, the topics you, uh, you listed originally uh, when, you, when you opened up? In particular, you know, how is that sort of full visibility from, from origin to what, what you're seeing happening out there? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll revisit those three observations and, I, and I'll actually start with the, the third observation that we made and that is the uh, pushing upstream of the full visibility and the need for inventory accuracy throughout the supply chain. Uh, we, we have a project right now, uh, the Project Zipper that we're working on uh, with GS1 and other partners. We have uh, eight brands and five major retailers working in this project. And, and what, we're, what we're doing is looking at the visibility. Can you guys hear me in the back? Is it okay? Is it okay in the back? Yeah, got some thumbs up back there. Thank okay. you. So, so what we're trying to do is, is look at that inventory accuracy from point of manufacture all the way through um, the, uh, the sale of the product. And it's really been an interesting exercise. We were overlaying or using also blockchain in that project uh, with working with some partners from Microsoft and Mojix and others uh, because we see that as a way to, to really share that information accurately and, and reliably and have that platform there to be able to do that. Uh, but it's, it's really been eye-opening when you, when you look at it across the entire supply chain of the sharing of information from one uh, supply chain partner to the next and the, the, the issues or things that one must consider in transferring that information. But so far, uh, the, the project's going very well um, and, and, it's, and it's really uh, uncovered some great use cases for the brand owners along the entire supply chain instead of just waiting until it gets to the store. So that, that's one thing. Um, the, uh, the second thing that we're seeing, I mentioned earlier about some retailers really paying lip service to inventory accuracy, but not really addressing inventory accuracy the way it should. I'll just give you a couple of examples of some retailers that, that we worked with in the last year or so that looked at and, and talked a lot about the need for inventory accuracy but when it came down to it, was either not measuring inventory accuracy 
properly or was masking the issues that they have with inventory accuracy. You know, one thing that, that, that Marco mentioned was, and, and it's a point that, that's, that we saw some retailers miss, and that is the need for high inventory accuracy at the SKU level, at the, at the consumer facing level. And we still have retailers that we're working with that, that measure inventory accuracy at the category level. And that's, that's, not, uh, that's not sufficient in today's environment. So, so that led to many other issues. But I'll, just get, I'll share with you a couple of things that we saw, and it will probably be obvious to everybody here, but it, it continues to be something that we see in masking the issues that are happening. Uh, I'll give you, give you one, is we, we saw in, in buy online, pick up in store, for example, uh, really a, a necessary element in an omni-channel um, strategy. We, we saw, uh, you know, in 2016, high error rates, uh, failure rates in buy online, pick up in store, over 50%, that there was some type of error. So in addressing those, those issues going forward, it, it, it really depends upon high inventory accuracy. But what we saw some retailers do is really mask that problem with, with uh, the buy online pickup in, in store, rather than addressing that with inventory accuracy, just addressed it as a failure rate. And I'll, I'll give you one example of a, of a retailer that had a fairly high failure rate on their buy online pickup in store because they had low inventory accuracy. Instead of attacking inventory accuracy, they changed the rules of how they measured success in buy online pickup in store. So this particular retailer, what they, what they considered um, uh, a success was that if somebody came to the store and found the product, you know, or, or they'd, they'd ordered online, they came to the store and they, and they bought it. That was a success. But how they then measured that was if the, the consumer up to any point to purchasing the product canceled that transaction, then it was not considered in their calculation of whether it was a success or not. And, and so what they would do was, the consumer would go online, buy the product, go to pick it up in the store. The retailer then at some point, if they determined that they didn't have it or uh, you know, just couldn't find the product or was gonna be delayed, they would send a text, an email to the consumer saying, look, we can't find your product, it's gonna be uh, two weeks before we get it, do you still want this product? And if the consumer said, no, I don't want it, then they, they just pretended like the, the transaction never happened. So, so they went from 50% or so success to over 90% success because of the way that they measured it. That doesn't solve the problem, that just masks the problem. We, we also saw some, some similar issues with, with ship from store of how they masked those. So, so we, we saw things that really paying lip service trying to do it, but without fundamentally starting the inventory accuracy. That's great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for, for sharing those. I mean, I, I want to sort of to shift gears and to, I mean, the pursuit of happiness is, is probably one of the most universal uh, uh, motivations of humanity. And um, I mean, one of the things we've, we've recently at Avery Dennison published a, a report that we call flow over friction. So how do you create, how do you improve the overall experience by removing the friction that happens across all the channels? And uh, we've, uh, as recently as today, is actually up on our web in case obviously you guys would like to download it just to have a look. And basically what we're saying is, uh, uh, is looking into how RFID and sort of other sort of interconnected sensors are, are sort of allowing us to change the paradigm of, of, uh, of retail, so to speak. So we do believe that you know, th this concept of connected products provide an improved flow of data. If you connect the channels, then you, you provide an improved flow of experiences. And if you actually connect feelings, you could provide an improved flow of happiness. And you actually, if you think through pushing the boundaries out there on how this connectivity of products allows you to take things further, I think you know, that uh, that's actually would open up uh, an amazing opportunity from a consumer experience. So what I would love the panel to, to elaborate on is how do you see RFID actually impacting this sort of overarching consumer experience that I just alluded to, and maybe eventually starting by Dr. Bill Hargrave, just providing sort of an, a, a, an umbrella, sort of high level view of what you're seeing out there, and then eventually you guys sharing what examples you've seen through your uh, um, deployments. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's really interesting when you look at ultimately, I mean, if you, were to, if you were to draw a model of what this looks like leading to sale, that last stop before a sale, uh, one of the main indicators is, is consumer satisfaction. 
And in a non-omni-channel environment, there are very there there are many uh, there, there are fewer variables in a non-omni-channel environment affecting consumer satisfaction than there are in an omni-channel environment. And that's that's kind of the the, the paradox here is that you know in an omni-channel environment where we are moving to trying to satisfy the consumer, we actually create more complexity and, it, and there are more variables that impact ultimately the consumer satisfaction. And in fact, the consumer is more demanding and less forgiving in an omni-channel environment than they are in a non-omni-channel environment. So when you look at all those variables that lead to that consumer satisfaction, there are many, many points that we can touch. What we, what we are seeing, however, uh, early on, and I think, I think these gentlemen can speak to this, is that when you do those things right, then the consumer experience is better, leading to higher sales. And one of the ways that, that we, we look at the consumer experience is net promoter score, NPS. Absolutely. And that we are seeing those retailers, at least early on in this, in this setting, their net promoter, net promoter scores going up as a result of RFID enabling high inventory accuracy leading to a better omni-channel experience. It's great. And Threads and last year we did hear that obviously Adidas was also measuring net promoter score from that lens. I mean, any additional thoughts around the sort of the, the overarching uh, experience? Yes, consumer experience is very important for us and actually we are striving to deliver great consumer experience for, for, our, uh, for our brand. There, there are ultimately three things. We need to have the right product at the right place in the right time. And we, we have actually, we have a couple of examples where we can illustrate the power of RFID technology. I'm going to focus on stock accuracy and on floor availability. Stock accuracy actually helps us to bring the levels of accuracy on SQ level, like Marco said, like uh, Mr. Hargrave just confirmed, towards a very high level of 99%. And that's very important. However, right now on this slide, I'm going to focus on so-called on-floor availability. On-floor availability is a KPI that we are measuring on a daily basis several times, and we know what is available in front of the store on the sales floor versus what we're having at the back of the store. So basically the data that is coming from the RFID help us to actually um, a little bit change the way we are conducting our buy and optimizing the buy on a seasonal level. This is additional benefit that helps the end consumer by the fact that our merchandisers know which products should be and has to be in each particular store. So this is, uh, this is one of the benefits that we, never, that we never communicate usually because it's not very visible, but it has a very high impact on our back office process. So when we move to the next slide, I'm going to illustrate one actually example from Russian business. So this is shipped from store, one of the omnichannel activities that is actually executed from uh, the colleagues that are sitting here on the first couple of rows. And I want to thank them for supporting us uh, together with the global IT and everyone who has been involved in this project from both markets, Russia and US. This is how it looks, our econ page, when actually we don't have RFID building the inventory accuracy for the ship from store. So this is if we are replenishing customer orders only from our distribution centers. So in Russia, what we did is actually we executed RFID as a baseline, being secure that every product that we are having in the stores actually will be available. And if you click one more time, you'll see what is the situation when you actually, we have 40 stores using as a small distribution centers and being able to provide this transparency to our end consumers. And if you click one more time, then you'll see, Francisco, one more time, and then you'll see actually we have the full availability showcase on our econ page available for each and one customer. This is just one of the example how actually we are going towards this ultimate customer satisfaction. It's great, very visual. I think everyone clearly understands the benefits, so appreciate it. Marco, perspective from you on what you saw in Sports Zone and uh, what you guys have experienced? Yeah. Um, yes. So be besides the, the concept of net promoting score, that is a little hard to measure, um, we, we have 
like two types of happiness. One of uh, them is the most important is of our board. Okay? So as we have achieved during the pilot 6% of sales uplift, they were happy. Okay? And this is the, 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 the beginning. The second one, and the, the very important also, is the change management. Okay? So the friction that we get and we have achieved on the stores associates. So what we, we, we have found that the, the effort of picking the items on the, on the back room reduced a lot. Okay? And when giving you a, sharing you a, an example, we use the, the handheld devices. We have acquired for the rollout only uh, two or three on average per, per store. Our stores are more or less uh, 800 square meters, okay? And we, we have acquired only the handheld devices to the back room. So after the deployment, and we, had, we spent two months on the deployment, okay, with 100 stores, um, the associates were like with commas fighting for the, the handheld device because they were using, they were using the, 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 the RFID handheld also for, as a store, uh, sales, uh, sales tool, okay? Be, because it helped us them to, 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 get the, to, to give information for, the, for the, the associates. So the happiness grew a lot and, and uh, helps a lot and boosts the deployment of the, 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 the RFID. Excellent, thank you. Um, so one of the things we, we, uh, we've seen uh, somewhat related to this is, um, I mean, recently GS1 has, uh, has come forward with a sort of a standardization of interconnecting the RFID uniqueness to barcodes, right? So you could have a 2D code that's actually on a product that reflects the unique code of, of, the, uh, of the RFID EPC code, if you'd like. And as a consequence of that, you actually allow the consumers by using standard telephones that we all have with cameras today to actually interact with that information and build on that to either create sort of in-store improved experiences and or post-purchase experiences uh, uh, that go uh, you know, beyond the moment of truth or beyond the point of sale. I mean, I'll, I'll be interested. I mean, this is just one thing we're seeing. I mean, what other things are we sort of uh, uh, seeing in terms of uh, sort of key trends that as, as we move forward and would love to have sort of a perspective, Dr. Hardware, from you as, a, as you, you sort of over, have a, a broader perspective of the market and obviously from you guys about what you think is going to be next for Adidas and next for Sonai from a broader perspective as well. Would love just to have a sort of a future perspective from there. So there's some things that we're seeing the, this past year which I think are, are going to lend themselves to the, to the near term. Um, one is it specifically related to RFID is the, the broadening of a portfolio of technologies that are available to help solve a variety of use cases. And, and we, we were talking before the panel uh, about the, the growth of those technologies and the, the, the number of use cases that one can now solve. And, and so we're seeing that now with a portfolio of this technology. It's not just a handheld you know, which solves a, a certain amount of technology, because now we're seeing overhead systems, we're seeing autonomous uh, robots and drones and those type of things. And I think we'll continue to see uh, uh, those technologies grow as a way to, to be able to read the RFID tagged products, regardless of whether they're in a, uh, a warehouse or in the, the back room of the store or in a sales floor. To layer on top of that, uh, we're seeing more of what we're calling the, the, the idea of sensor fusion, that RFID is just one type of sensor among many types of sensors that will continue to grow and, and, and provide insight into the consumer and be able to enable uh, and, and help grow a great consumer experience, whether that's uh, you know, computer vision or um, you know, lot, lots of different things that are there that can help, and we're, and we're starting to see more and more retailers investigate blending those technologies into, into a, a sensor fusion. You know, the, the, um, fr from a very pragmatic perspective on RFID, we are seeing more retailers using RFID to some extent this year than we did last. About a, mm -hmm. uh, we take an inventory about uh, June of each year as to the retailers in the U.S. in particular who are doing something with RFID from, from starting pilots all the way through full deployment. Uh, we saw about a 39% increase in the number of retailers who were doing something with RFID. And as those, as those 
uh, adoptions move up that adoption curve to full deployment, it really sets the stage for more categories to be RFID enabled beyond apparel uh, and accessories that we've seen in the past. Because once the infrastructure is in place, then rolling out more categories becomes becomes uh, much simpler. So we're we're seeing that, and I'll, I'll I'll mention one other thing too, and that is um, again looking at it. Uh, and, across the entire supply chain from point of manufacturer all the way down. I think we'll continue to see that in the future. Um, very excited, very bullish right now on, on the use of blockchain as, as a way then to be able to accurately and reliably sh share that information among trading partners. So th those any, are just some of the things that come to mind. Any industry in particular you would call out or it just you just see? I mean, you said you talked about sort of expansion of that. Any, 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 or? You, you know, uh, we're, we're starting to see. Um, Obviously, there's the aviation piece that, of course, you, you're yeah, very linked into, yeah, but right. as an I mean, example. Uh, I mean, be, beyond retail, right? I mean, we're, we are seeing a couple of areas in particular, uh, actually three areas in particular, two that, that are right upon us and one that's coming. Um, we, we're doing a lot more work in, in outside of retail uh, in uh, aviation, in the manufacturing uh, of planes, but also baggage tagging uh, um, and uh, parts that are on the plane, flyable parts. So we're, we're seeing a lot of use there. Uh, automobile manufacturing, much more use there. And then the, and the big one I think that's coming, and we're, we're, we've been working on this for some time, but, uh, but we're getting closer. And that's in, that's in food safety, food quality, and okay. RFID and the use of food. And that, to me, in retail, that's the, that's the natural progression from where we've seen it in other parts of retail. But that's a, it's a huge one. And I think with, uh, as the technology continues to advance, we're seeing great strides in food safety, food quality, and, and, and the work that sensors such as RFID can do there. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stetson? I can, ju I can just confirm what Mr. Hargrave said. And, um, I will see a couple of trends that will be important for Adidas. Digitalization is definitely the most important. Technology will play more and more uh, role in our stores. I see that RFID will evolve. We see lots of players on the hardware market that are presenting overhead readers. We haven't seen big deployments so far, but I do believe that this is the future by eliminating the basic human efforts in the stores and, and really delivering this accuracy from the technology, but not from the humans. So this is the first one that I see. The second one, uh, I do believe that um, it's about time when we start connecting the dots within the RFID, starting from supply chain, retail, and production. So this is the ultimate goal, to, to have actually full visibility throughout the supply chain, retail, and end-to-end -end consumer. So end-to-end -end tracking, and I do believe that soon this will become a trend. And the third one, it's actually consumer engagement. You do have a tag, which is a digital piece that is sitting on our clothes or is just marketing tag regardless. And we'll be able potentially in the future to connect this digital piece with the internet of things and other digital projects that we are having. It's up to us to define how, when, and how, and, and, and how we are going to do it. But uh, we are just a couple of steps away from this and we're very, confident. Fitting room is just one, one of the examples, but there are many, many other cases. Excellent. Sounds exciting. So uh, we're certainly looking forward to uh, driving those and supporting those. And sort of mark a high level what's next for Sonai, whether it's within Sports Zone or other areas within the, the, the broader company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, our, our approach of the RFID as a company is really straightforward. Uh, we felt, we feel that we are living like the whole story of the barcode. So t 25 years ago, we were uh, printing barcodes on a small bottle of water, and we were questioning, it, does it make sense using a barcode with a small ship item? OK, that's more or less the same. We, f we believe that uh, we will use RFID on all, all the, the, the products. And, and based on the RFID, we, will, we can explore what we want, customer engagement. But the, um, the main insights I would like to, to share with, the, the, with you, with the audience, based on, the, on the, the pilot, based on the, the deployment. Uh, one of them was during the source tagging processes, OK? When we were um, on the sessions with the Chinese or the Indian uh, vendors, suppliers, sorry, they were asking us when we were saying, please be aware, guys, that we will check item by item, 
when, you, uh, when we will receive your deliveries, okay? And once they felt that we'll uh, really um, audit all the, the, uh, the, the deliveries, they ask us, please, where can I buy a device to check my shipping, my shipments from my factories, okay? So uh, we felt that there is a, a growth avenue for the, the, the producers and, and the, the factories. Uh, the other one, and maybe there are uh, on the audience some, some software houses, is how to help the, the in-store processes, not related to supply chain, but related to the in-store uh, process. Uh, giving us some examples, the, 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 the change prices, the process of changing price, it, it represents a lot of effort, okay? And nowadays we are moving and taking decisions on a daily basis. So if I need to change on a store 500 uh, items, it will be a mess in terms of uh, uh, effort. So how uh, RFID technology could help the stores in terms of uh, efficiency, how to pick the items that has changed price and not to, as we do today, uh, split the 500 change prices per day in order to avoid uh, missing uh, change prices, okay? And th this is uh, one of the, mm, the, the growth avenues we, we, we hope to, to solve next, next year. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Marco, thank you all. Uh, I think it's, a, uh, obviously, it's, it's great to see that it's reinforcing some of the observations that uh, Dr. Hargrave was sharing with us. I think it's a great timing just to open up for uh, some questions from the audience. I'm not sure if there's uh, some microphones. I've got one I can throw it if anyone can catch. Or uh, maybe if someone uh, can sort of help out, uh, provide that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. So any, any questions you know, to the panelists, any comments, any ideas, any observations, uh, we would be open. There's one there, Maria, please. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. Dr. Hargrave, you mentioned some mistakes that retailers made uh, in 2017. Can you address uh, how those are being corrected in 2018? Thank you. I'm sorry, could you just speak a little bit? Yeah. Sorry. Retailers had trouble in 2017, uh, some mistakes they made in implementation. Can you maybe address, uh, answer how they're addressing that in 2018 and corrections they're making? Thanks. So, so the, yeah, I mentioned some of the mistakes that, that were made by retailers, especially in implementing buy online, pick up in store, and ship from store in particular. Uh, you know, we, and I'll mention one other that, that, was, that was made in relation to buy online, pick up and store, and it's, and it's a common error that's made, is that uh, to reveal the inventory to the customers, uh, most retailers, many retailers that we work with, will, will put some type of buffer in place, you know, so that they, uh, before they'll show it online, right? So, you know, if we only ha if we have two or more, then we'll show it online uh, to our online customers. Anything less than that, we won't we won't reveal that. But the interesting thing is that, and, and this is something that we're seeing retailers now start taking as a metric: how much inventory are you hiding when you do that? And and, and some major retailers we worked with, just by using a buffer of two, they're hiding as much as 60% of their inventory from their non-in-store customers. And so we've seen retailers then take action on that in particular. For those who get their inventory accuracy above 95% where you have, uh, you, you have a high visibility into your inventory and you have high confidence in what you have, then, then we're seeing the number of SKUs that are made visible uh, grow by 50, 60% uh, in some of these cases. Uh, in, in other cases, we've seen retailers uh, to address this problem really start using some metrics uh, on, on their uh, number, number of SKUs that they're involving uh, in, across the, the channels. They pick, pick rate success of their ship from store, and, and, and Stetson talked about that earlier. Um, but it's really all about getting high inventory accuracy. Uh, the, the good news is for those, some of those that we talked to, and really pointed out the problem. Uh, I'll give you one, ca one particular case. A across six categories, um, the highest inventory accuracy they had was 61%. The others were in the 30s. And they went from that to, to over 95% across those categories. And as a result, uh, they were able to, to uh, 
provide a lot more product visibility to their consumers. Anything so to add there? We have another question here. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Wow, it's really exciting to hear a lot of the progress that uh, your panelists have been making with RFID. Um, I'd love to ask them what they see as they move forward with the biggest challenges to further implementation and integration with RFID. Are, are uh, human factors, or I mean, absolutely anything. Just love to know what you think about that. So I can speak on behalf of Adidas. RFID is complex. You, you have to remember this one. It's a huge monster program. You have to involve the senior management and you have to have a full support to senior management. It's complex and it's expensive. Keep it simple and deliver only the KPIs that are relevant for you. We've seen many implementations actually that uh, failed because people try to get it all at the same time. Change management, Marco already spoke about this one. It's a huge. Be ready to actually showcase the program and demonstrate it. We in Adidas, for example, we do have a showroom in our headquarters and we do this we, and we are creating showrooms in every market where we can demonstrate the program and the power because it's, it's great to speak about RFID and the KPS, etc. But seeing it is believing it, especially when we are talking about store stuff that is operating on a daily basis. And the last, the last thing, it's not one-man show. So you have to have a good team and partners in several different departments that are going to support you from omnichannel, IT, business solutions, legal, or it's so only for North American market, I counted for the first three months about 100 people that being involved in our implementation. And then I stopped counting because it doesn't make sense. We already built a proper team, but build a proper team and get the connections in place before you start. <clears throat> yes, um, sharing a bit with you, uh, in our case, um, I moved from the sports division to the fashion division of Sonai in uh, September, and we will start a uh, pilot with RFID on the fashion division, but uh, I want to highlight the detail. We will again do a pilot, not because we don't believe in RFID, we're sure we believe in RFID, but we, we need to find the use case of the fashion division, we will, and we'll design the pilot again and not go straight forward to, to the to the, the, the deployment. It's a, an important detail, of course, what the threat highlighted in terms of the team, who will measure the KPIs, okay? Who will take the decision? The IT will, must be with the, with the team, okay? And everyone will, must be involved on the, on, the, on the project because it's a, really a huge um, uh, effort. But we, we, you got to do it step by step. So do a pilot. Uh, confirm the numbers, define before the, the baselines, and then uh, build the business case for, for a deployment. Thank you. Thank you, Marco and Setson. Uh, sorry. We have one last question. We have time maybe for two minutes. Hi. Thank you for the interesting panel. And I have actually two questions. One is regarding other technologies. Do you see any other technologies uh, that maybe can uh, replace RFID now or in the future? And the second ca question regarding the RFID costs, tags and hardware and so on. I believe we reached the cost point that is making it possible to have a good business case. Uh, do you think it ha still has a great potential of uh, lowering even uh, further the costs? Uh, 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 what is the, 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 the pot still the potential to have a lower cost? Thank you. Um, I can you just make a comment about our business case. If we were not successful in returning the investment in a big market like Russia, where we have more than 700 stores, we wouldn't go to another big market like North America. So for us, the business case is uh, very profitable. And the return of investment is, uh, yes, it's a huge investment when we are talking about uh, the, the tax that, that we are buying from our partners. But uh, yes, there is a return of investment. It depends what's your business case. Any perspective on new technologies? I mean, uh, just, just, I mean, as we're talking about the business case, I'll just say that uh, th th that is a trend 
for obviously as, as things become, as adoption uh, uh, expands, you would expect things to become tendency, to, to tend to be more, more competitive as there's new hardware, there's new providers for a number of things, you know, and, and volumes increase. So there is a, a, and we've seen that trend over the years where the solutions today are more competitive than were last year or a couple of years ago or even before. I think that's the first thing. The second thing I would say, by and large, depending on how you look at how you amortize and whatever, you could actually say that you, know, you should have a payback of a project typically we've seen in less than 12 months. So that is very clear ROI. Again, different use cases, we are gonna drive different numbers, but by definition, there is a very, there's clarity of ROI, and that's one of the things we always encourage customers and partners to work with to have a thorough understanding of. So maybe through the technology lens, uh, Dr. Hargrave, or any other comments from your well, side? Well, you know, one of the questions you asked, which I, I, it's a very interesting question and a good question, and that is, do we see anything on the horizon that would um, displace RFID as a solution? And we, we have not seen anything, nor did we see anything coming that would displace RFID as a solution to the, to the many use cases that we see across retail and other industries. But I, but I would harken back to something I mentioned earlier, and that is RFID does not solve all issues in retail and other industries. It, it is a, uh, and I believe in retail, in an omni-channel environment, it is the foundation to enable you to facilitate and enable inventory accuracy. And it all starts with inventory accuracy. And, and it is the best technology that, in my opinion, to provide an effective and efficient solution for inventory accuracy. But there are other technologies, you know, and I mentioned, you know, computer visualization. There's lots of other things there that will grow to help um, really address the, the growing number of use cases in retail. Okay, um, I, I think, think we're out of time. yeah, we're we are literally out of time. running out of time. We'll be happy to just, you know, interact Connect. and have a conversation. Again, if you uh, if you uh, would just join me and uh, thanking the panel for the insights. Thank you all for attending.